All right. Great, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah! Calisthenics, let's all wake up! Woo! Yeah. All right, well, this is a session called Taking the Tears Out of Teardown, How to Build for a Better Strike. Raise your hand if you've ever had a shit show strike. former campmates. <laughs> um, I am Little Drunk Kitten from Stardust Lounge, um, moderating this session. The irony of uh, Stardust Lounge model it, moderating a session on strike is that we are terrible at strike, um, which is why I am here to learn just as much as you can sit here. Uh, um, if may you don't, you yeah, we may ask some questions. Uh, just as much as you from our incredible panelists today, we have three kick-ass strike leads. We have 100% from the duck pond. 100% is a fourth year duck spending the last three years as part of the planning committee for the camp. Uh, first burn, 100%, there was a project lead who couldn't attend suddenly. 100% stepped up, gave it 150%, and, and suddenly became part of the planning committee for the last uh, two years, has been co-leading <laughs> co the planning committee. Uh, next up, we have Endless Fun from Pink Heart, uh, who has attended 13, 13 burns, uh, and seven of them, of them with Pink Heart for the last three years, Endless Fun has been camp treasurer and a member of the Pink Heart operations team. And over here we have Power Slout from suspended, <laughs> from suspended Animation. They are a fourth year burner as well as second year camp lead for Suspended Animation, one of the three leads uh, on Playa for the camp. Uh, <laughs> Power Slout describes himself as a human herder, structures lead, event coordinator, and recruiter. So we're gonna get started. Uh, and I'm going to ask uh, these lovely panelists the same question. Tell us about your camp's overall build and strike process. How do you build for a better strike? Power slap. Okay. Um, so uh, basically we have like a series of events that we want everybody to kind of go through. Um, the first thing is like strike time, not for packing your personal gear. That needs to be done before strike always super important. Um, we rely on all of our camp members to pack their stuff before in their own personal time. So that kind of takes the stress out of tearing down the rest of the camp when that last person still has their tent up and we're trying to strike our pavilion or our condo and everything's falling on top of their stuff. Um, so the second thing is it's your camp. That's what we tell all of our camp members. It's your camp, not our camp. We're leading it, but it's yours. Um, so thus, everybody builds, everybody strikes. Um, sh you show up in the morning well rested, so don't go out and party and get like super shitty <laughs> the night before and not have any energy or capability to be able to strike. Um, and you don't get to leave the work site unless you need to use the bathroom, essentially. Um, you don't get to go vis visit your friends to say goodbye, um, and you don't get to run your personal errands. This is the time for all of us to come together and do strike. Um, so air traffic control. This is a concept that we use to avoid the situation where only one person knows what to do. Right? Everybody stands around with their hands in their pockets. They're like, oh my God, like, I don't, I don't have a job. I guess I'll just like wander over here to, you know, wh wherever. Um, so air traffic control maintains situational, uh, woo! <laughs> Our air traffic control person maintains situational awareness. Um, this is always a veteran burner. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a camp lead, but it's a vet burner who kind of has an idea of what that whole process looks like, build and strike. 
So if you need a job, check in with the ATC and they'll give you a task or somebody else to report to who they know needs help with a job. Um, similarly, if you're running a specific strike project, like I have to strike electrics, I need help with that. I uh, go to ATC and say, hey, I need four people to help me strike electrics and they will basically voluntold somebody to go help with electrics. Um, we always anticipate our bottlenecks and dependencies before they happen and staff accordingly. Um, we have a rule that we like to implement called our 75% rule. We tell people always work at 75% of what you think you should be working at. What you think, not what you are, right? What you're capable of. So if you think that you need to be working like a crazy person to get everything done, oh my God, I, there's so many exciting things happening. Slow down. And we will point at people and say, are you working at 75%? This works really well, especially for people who just want to get the job done as fast as possible. And you can see they're sweating and they're tired and they're getting cranky. <laughs> and those people, we put on our 25% duty. So 25% <laughs> duty is, okay, you're done. Go get a drink, go sit in the shade, etc. Um, don't ever underestimate the power of a motivational clap on the back and a quiet, you're doing a great job, thank you. It goes a long way. And then uh, lastly, we're pretty good at knowing what to do, but we're world class at knowing what not to do <laughs> and um, calmly assessing the situation. Uh, favoring decisions over consensus and peacefully going about our work. We run a benevolent dictatorship at Suspended Animation. This means somebody might have a really great idea for something and say, hey, can we do this thing? And we're like, no. And they have to be okay with hearing now. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Powerful. Yeah. All right. Up next on the spot. Woo. So I have to say, I just got off a plane from Australia, so I am not as pulled together as this fabulous woman. Um, but I'm here. But I'm here. Um, so at Pink Heart, there is a requirement. We, you know, we have very little requirements of our campmates. You have to do a few shifts. You need to be there. There's a great team for build, so we've got build usually covered. We want people to be there present, connecting with people in the lounge. But strike is like, there is no excuses. You have to attend strike. Um, we require, like, we are waking people up 7.45 Sunday morning. So if you, if that is a difficult thing for a person, then you don't camp with Pink Heart Camp. We literally last year had some, one of our most responsible people get completely blitzed and wake him up. And he, <laughs> he felt horrible because he knew that that was his responsibility and, and he went a little overboard on it. Um, so really, we are running around 745 Sunday morning, pink heart camp, get your asses up, time for strike. Um, we focus primarily on our, our lounge first because that's the most part, the like most labor intensive part of our infrastructure. And so we will have people who are in charge of lighting, people in charge of taking down fabric. Um, we'll have people in charge of fluffers because it's, you know, it's really easy to get really, you know, 2017, I heard a couple people say that, like, that year fucking sucked. Um, it took us like 12 hours that year because it was so bad. Um, so we really, you know, I love the 75% rule, um, but we're really trying to make sure that people get their sunscreen, people get their water, people get fed. Um, we've got a great camp that, or a great camp kitchen that takes a big part of that. So it's really, um, you know, it's not always perfect. We're working on a new system that's kind of like a, a game board, right? Like you can't do this one thing until you do this one piece. So things aren't ready when they shouldn't be. Um, you know, an example is we don't want to pull down the kitchen and our last shade structure at the beginning of the day because then we've completely screwed ourselves for food and the supplies that we need and the shade to get through the rest of the day. Um, our inventory piece is really important because we have two containers at the burn. So that is stored by Burning Man in Gerlach. We don't get access to it throughout the year. So um, the biggest part of our inventory and, and takedown has been inventory. A big part of our strike has been inventory, really making sure that we have a very clear understanding of what is in each of the bins that we have 
taking pictures. It's really, we had <coughs> three documentation people this year, full of, solely focused on making sure that we know exactly what's in our bins. Um, and, and again, t the time. It's really important that we know what we need to do when. Um, so focusing on the lounge, you know, we've had issues the last couple years, actually, we've had water delivered like really too late and we've had to give out tons and tons and tons of water, which helps people but freaks us out <laughs> because we're like, oh, we got to get that rug that's under the, yeah. Um, so really being mindful about it um, and, and we're continuing to learn um, and continuing to build on what we've known and what works. So much. That's fine. 100%. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so Duck Pond does a lot of things that both of these camps do. We have a rule that is prevalent from our first kickoff, which is everybody tears down. There are pretty much no exceptions to this. It's in our verbiage from beginning to end. Um, the one exception is our truck team. They'll start our teardown, and then at a certain point, they're exempt because by the time we're all done, they need to get that truck on the road and going to where it needs to go. And so we need them fit and happy and rested. Um, other than that, if you fail to show up, you are no longer a duck. Like no matter how great of a friend you are, we have that conversation and it's an expectation from the beginning. It shouldn't be a surprise. Um, we also do things in, it's a little bit of organized chaos in the beginning. Everyone kind of runs their project. We bring everything down to the ground. Anything that needs all hands, We'll make a call, all hands meet to the giant duck, take the thing down, go back to whatever project you're working on. There's a certain point where the bottlenecks happen, right? We have one or two storage containers. There's only so much tetrising and only so many bodies that you need. So just in the last few years, we've developed an A-B team. So once everything is physically broken down and just kind of laying in piles in the dust, we divide our camp in half. So half the team is working, fire lining, organizing, the other half can rest, get their water, get their sunscreen. If they choose to tear down their personal stuff, that's your time. If you want to rest, you can rest. You can do your personal stuff later. Um, yeah, no, go for it. Yeah, so when the bottleneck is happening, half of our camp is still working and organizing. The other half can choose their own adventure. You can get your water, get some rest. You can tear down your personal tent. And then we switch. So it's like 35, like 40 minutes. It all kind of depends on like how hot it is. We start super early, um, but yeah, so we switch every 35, 40 minutes. Yeah, um, I would say we get about three to four hours of like tear down where all hands are on deck, everyone's running around, and then as soon as that bottleneck starts to happen, we call pause, divide up everybody, and go, group A, you're on, group B, take a rest. Yeah, it's really, find it to be really helpful for sanity and for productivity because you get a lot of people running around, I don't know what to do, you get a lot of voices in the kitchen. We try to have two voices for lead. Like, this is going there. I need this here. Um, but beforehand, it's just a lot of, what should I be doing? I want to help. Everyone told me I should help. How can I help? <laughs> and you're like, just go sit down. <laughs> It'll be all right. About 50 people. We float in that, like, pocket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't think Duck Pond is your camp. Sorry. Uh, the question was, what happens if people uh, want to leave in a staggered fashion for whatever reason? They have to get back early. Can they still? What, what's the process then? So, So uh, Pink Heart, we're about 100 people, um, and we, uh, our build crew gets there Wednesday afternoon, Thursday, um, and it's pretty much building all the way through Sunday, and then we do tear down first thing Sunday morning. Um, so suspended animation, only, we max out at 35. 
that's all we allow. Uh, to answer your question about um, whether we can have staggered folks, um, I, we pride ourselves on understanding good faith. Uh, if you need to leave early for an emergency or if uh, you had planned that ahead of time and we okayed it, uh, as a general, you're a good egg and we like you, and we think you're gonna bring more awesome than the effort that it takes for the rest of the crew when you leave, great. If somebody <laughs> um, leaves early and they're like, you know what, I don't wanna do this, we will tell you, okay, well, you stand in front of your entire crew and you tell us and your crew why you're gonna make it harder for them when you leave. If you're not willing to do that, you don't fit in with us. Yeah, I mean, we've had one exception, and that was our team lead, our camp lead for 10 years, who's also heavily involved in, um, in art and, and everything. So she literally did that Facebook message, hey guys, you know, my husband's not coming this year, my mom's sick, I really wanna be on the playa with you, but I have to leave early. And there was a resounding yes, you yes. But literally, we don't make exceptions. Um, I literally have still in my desk somewhere to camp maps for the last three or four years where I mark, I know exactly who's been at strike, who's late, the same thing. Um, and we've had people who've stayed in their RV, not responded, and we've per, per basically said, you're not coming back. Not basically, but yeah. basically you're not coming back. I have one more thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, to circle back to that question, uh, there is an example of a time, obviously, where we allowed that, where one of our camp mates is a teacher, right? And as we all know, teachers have a very hard time getting to the burn. And so at the last minute, she's like, okay, I got some babysitting of a thing. I could only come the first half of the week. And she came for build, like one of the hardest parts of the week, and was there for like one day. And we're like, yeah, of course you can come. You're going to work super hard. So there are crazy exceptions. But if you're just like, I don't know if I can do the whole week, and I'm just kind of tired, n no. like you guys if you don't if you do anything we don't want you back um, but what we did was we um, we came up with a, a whole list of things that need to be done right we need things done and so if you're willing to take on one of those things that we chose that we needed we had we posted it and we're like take one of these it's a significant task we need it done and if you're willing to do that you've shown good faith and we're like yeah we understand you have to leave um, we have a couple questions uh, for the panelists, and then we're going to open it up to the discussion. So um, question for uh, all three of you, actually. What expectations do you set for campmates going in? And I think we've already touched on it a little bit, but like, what, what do people, like, how do, you, how do you set those expectations? Um, so we have a three-part interview process for every single person that wants to join our camp. They have to interview which, with each of our three camp leads. Um, we've been toying with the idea of maybe having one of our camp members also uh, in good standing uh, interview people. But during those interviews, we, we ask a lot of sometimes absurd questions, sometimes questions that help us dig deeper into somebody's personality, not just like your basic, are you gonna work hard? Because of course every single person is gonna say, yeah. I'm going to work hard. Um, so with this three-part interview process, one, one of us covers personality types. Like, are you going to fit in with the rest of our crew? Are you going to feel like you've integrated into our crew? And that's going to kind of help keep a mode of, like, responsibility and accountability with the rest of the crew. Uh, another person covers logistics. So they're going to basically overwhelm you with every single logistical point that we have with our camp, which is a lot. And it kind of makes people take a step back and go, is this a thing that I want to do? Um, another person uh, gives what we call the fear of God speech. <laughs> if you've never been to Burning Man before, especially for virgins, right? Um, we let them know how difficult it can be to be on Playa and how much you're going to want to say, I can't do this anymore, right? Um, so while we're vetting these people, we go through our, our principles and our policies, um, specifically our everybody builds, everybody strikes. No, you don't get to get out of it. Like, it, maybe there's going to be a special circumstance. Um, 
but our expectations are really clear. Um, one of my favorite of our policies is our no drama policy. Um, this is kind of contentious with some people. <laughs> It is. It is. It's, it, we've enforced it before. Um, so our no drama policy specifically states um, that <laughs> uh, that you're, you're not allowed to cause contention. That doesn't mean you can't have a bad day. That doesn't mean you can't have like a argument with somebody. But you can't have an argument with somebody and ruin for other camp members burn. You can't cause intentional discord within the camp. The opposite of drama is what we consider grace. So um, when we're going in, we're giving everybody the ability to have grace under pressure. We're giving everybody the ability to look at each other and say, yeah, we just had a really shitty moment. It's okay. We're going to be okay support it's really important yeah that's awesome yeah so um <clears throat> we're we're a high profile camp um because of our camp mascot that's his title not mine um and so <laughs> literally it's on his freaking name tag i'm like yeah he's our he's our mascot um we love him um but there john has a really broad reach into the Burning Man culture and, and people who want to go to Burning Man. A lot of people look to his tips and tricks. And so we get a lot of people like, oh, my God, we want to be with Pink Heart. Like, we really want to be with Pink Heart. Um, and we've had to implement a rule where if you want to be a member of Pink Heart, you have to be connected to a campmate. So you can go to a regional. You can get to know someone outside of the burn. You're welcome to come and hang out with us at the burn. But, like, we need to get to know you because we're not going to invite you into our fold unless we really know that you're pink heart material. Um, and so we require that of sponsors to make sure, is this some person that you really believe embodies the, the message of pink heart? Because at the, at the end of the day, we're all there not to have a big party. Yeah, it's awesome. It's my birthday every week. So, you know, it's a big party. But we are there at pink heart because we want a gift. And if you're there because you want to camp with Halcyon or you want to, like, have all the ice cream that you want, then that's not your camp. And strike is the same thing, right? Like, that is a basic requirement for being a member of Pink Heart. Um, and really, it's, we're very upfront about it. Um, we actually now have a member acculturation community, committee, and we also have a, a new member committee as well. So... You fill out a questionnaire, and it's there very boldly. You will be there Sunday morning, and if that's a commitment that you can't make, then perhaps Pink Heart is not the camp for you. So we're very serious about it, and it's, it's said a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, maybe too much, but, like, strikes the most important thing, you know. If we, if we don't get a, you know, I mean, if we don't get that green spot on that moot map, right? Like that for us is the ultimate sign of success. And we've had a few years where, you know, there's been green or, or there's been yellow or red on our map. And we take that very, very, very seriously. Um, and that's the ultimate goal of strike is to make sure that we've covered all of it. Um, so a lot of similar themes. Um, one thing about Duck Pond is we're front and end heavy. We don't have bar, we're a bar, if you guys haven't visited us. Um, we don't have bar shifts throughout the week. If you're running an event, you can run an event, maybe pull in a person, but there's nothing really official or that's required of you as a duck apart from coming to build. We have one meal team and tear down. So that's why we really super stress from the beginning that this is an expectation because we're really not asking much of you. I mean, we're asking a lot of you, but... <laughs> In theory, for the week, like, this is your promise to your campmates. That being said, we are also a family. A lot of us live locally in the Bay. Um, we have, like, monthly migrations. We're always talking to each other. We're getting to know each other. So hopefully by the time we hit the dust, you're dealing with very few strangers. We have some out-of-town people, some people in Europe that come. So there's a little bit of getting to know people. But if someone fails to show up, that's your good friend now that you're letting down. So there's a little bit more emotional stakes that I think help inspire people to push through that feeling of I can't do this or I don't want to do this or I want to go home. So we just build that from the beginning in our messaging. 
<laughs> what are the, some of the ways that you keep uh, campmates motivated during the hardest part of teardown? You know, when everyone's tired and cranky and just wants to secretly escape. How do you, what do you do to get people motivated and keep them motivated? I'll start. I'll start. Um, so a lot of us <laughs> pit stop in Reno after teardown. So I usually do a lot of like, we've got this. It's a lot of just like pep talk and positive words and visions of hot tubs and showers. <laughs> uh, and just like to be aware and compassionate like as leads to like take a look at your campmates and if you see somebody like uh, somebody said earlier, kind of sweating, a little red, kind of working themselves too hard to, to give them permission to stop and to everyone's always constantly taking care of each other. And so there's a feeling of comfort in the discomfort that's pretty much all we got. <laughs> hugs, lots of hugs. <laughs> There's that. Um, we yeah always make sure we've got the fluffers, so water, sunscreen, that kind of thing. But honestly, the key to our strike recently in the last few years is we have the most amazing kitchen lead, and he like Sunday morning cinnamon rolls, bacon, like we'll literally come make sure you get fed um, and really try and keep everyone happy with water and, and all that stuff. Um, mainly support, uh, the entire crew offers support to each other. We stick with 35 people because it feels like a family, maybe an extended family, but a family. Um, our, our three person uh, team lead, or we call ourselves imperators, uh, we make sure to check in with people regularly. Like, we'll just, you know, you can kind of tell when somebody's kind of off. Um, it takes a very personal approach to make sure everybody's happy within the camp. You have to be personal with people um, throughout the week, during build and during strike. Um, what Zhang always says is, an empty stomach forgives nothing. <laughs> so, uh, and anticipate your crew needs to eat. They need to eat. Um, so have meals ready when people are starting to get hungry. You can tell when people kind of start flagging and we'll call all crew um, meals or, uh, you know, sun breaks, things like that. Um, again, the 25% duty, make sure that people get their 25% duty. They get breaks as needed. Every individual is going to be a little bit different. Um, and then our imperators remind each other um, that our first job is crew morale. Our second job is making sure everything gets done. That's great. That, that is awesome. Um, how uh, do you, does, do your camps do anything to celebrate the end of strike as, as you know, including like a, a, a special, like you're all meeting in Reno. Is there anything like a dinner or anything like that that you try to, any, um, so most of our crew is based out of Seattle. Uh, so on the drive back, we all stop in Bend, Oregon and stay at the McMinimins. <sighs> if anybody has ever been there, it is amazing. Mm -hmm. They have a saltwater soaking pool. They have a bunch of like weird rooms and things like that that are like secret. You have to like find the doorknob or like knock on the door just right. Um, and we all have dinner there and celebrate with what we call stories of the awesome. Um, so people can tell stories about the best part of their burn, et cetera. But that's that's a huge motivator for our crew. They're like, we get to go be in a soaking pool, wall water. <laughs> it's amazing. So yeah. <laughs> we have um, a post playa sushi lunch. It's like all oh, you can eat secret space. I'm not telling you guys where it is <laughs> in Reno, um, and that's a big one for us. It's a really big one for us. Um, we also do Reno. Uh, we got to like the pepper mill, and at some point we all try to do the buffet, and we all regret it. <laughs> um, and we all commiserate again together, lovingly. <laughs> Great. They do an official camp photo. That's awesome. Awesome. Um, it's almost time for questions. Uh, we're just going to do a lightning round where um, what are the top three best practices from your camp that you would like to share with other TCOs? Um, we run a benevolent dictatorship, like I said before. When uh, This means we run the show, questions are okay, but you've got to be okay with the answer no. 
Uh, for build and for strike, we hand out small individual jobs through our ACC, uh, but this means that uh, we're able to direct individual members of the camp to finish projects in small parts. So never, nobody ever feels overwhelmed by a huge project. It's just like, oh, I did this little thing, but wait, now we have a camp. Um, or we don't have a camp anymore, great. Um, and then of course our 70% rule is really the best thing that we feel like helps keep everything running uh, together and keeping people from getting burnt out and that's you know really what we thrive on. Hmm. I don't have an answer for this. Um, <laughs> no. um, I really think just um, the communication is a really big piece, being making very, very clear what the consequences are for not being there. Um, and, and the fluffing is a huge one. Um, and that it can always change. Um, we had some, some longtime camp leadership leave last year, and strike was less than stellar. Um, and we've had some new plans for new stuff. And so we just keep trying new things. You know, we're not certainly as, as uh, codified as these guys are, um, but we're getting there, and um, everyone's giving their best effort. Um, my top three are the two-team structure works really well um, in terms of getting people rest. One voice. Sometimes it's two voices, but a very clear leader of who you're listening to, of what goes where and what needs to happen when. And I had one more. I'm going to end on that one. Oh, everybody strikes, no matter what. <laughs> Great. Awesome. All right, we'll take questions. I'll run to you so you can be recorded for posterity. I saw you first. And, and tell which panelist you'd like to answer or all of them. Okay, sure. Um, yeah. a anyone. Um, <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Brooks uh, or Thor. I'm with Hotel California and I'm our strike lead. Um, my question is, how diligent are you with your final moving? Uh, I feel like my camp is insanely detailed. And that's like partly me, but like, I mean, we get great results, but it's insane. Are you also insane? Tell us what you do. Uh, in the where? Like how insane is your moving? Oh my God, it's just, you, you know, like we do, we do m several line walks we start, we start moving early. It's in parallel to other things. We use a metal. Uh, we do a metal sweep. We do rake sweeps. We do hand sweeps. Um, we move on top of the tarps. We move underneath the tarps. Um, we do perimeter walks. Um, yep. And then I usually do one final little walk around as well. Is that insane? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But what ends up on the map for them, right? And what ends up on the map for them? And what's the important thing for them? And so that's the same for us. We have couches, and we have a dome where interesting things happen. We have, um, yes, uh, we have rugs. So we are mooping um, before things are torn down. We're double checking the rugs. We're double checking the dome. We're doing lines. Um, I mean, really, we take it. <laughs> You never know what you're going to find in a moop sweep. You never know. Um. <laughs> Why do you think we always get green? No. Um, no, no, no. Lime sweeps are really, really important. I mean, we've had people with broken ankles, and we've had pregnant women, like, on the ground working and making sure that moops all up. So, like, we go to the insanity, and for us, that's the normal. Uh, to answer that question as well, we we lay down like canvas and things like that. Uh, and sometimes when we have sparkle ponies come and visit us and we have glitter, we literally fold all the playa up into it and then shake it out at home uh, because there's all sorts of moop in there that's going to blow away into the wind. We don't want it to affect our neighbors because moop, when you leave it behind, affects your neighbors. Ugh, come on. Um, and we also actually go just outside of our perimeter and uh, make sure that within like a five foot radius of us, everything is taken care of. So we're also just about as insane as you are. Yep. Did you want to? told I was insane when suggested it. Um, um, floor the entire map, finger or 
thumbprint of your camp prior to putting infrastructure down um, with like a vinyl flooring. <laughs> Hey everybody, um, my, name's, my name is Lauren. Uh, I want to speak to her last point. Uh, I run a camp called Playa Bike Repair, and uh, our entire camp is wall-to-wall uh, -wall vinyl. So uh, once we figure out what our placement is, then we put down vinyl, then we flag that for the trucks, then our campers arrive, and, um, and then they set up their, they pound right through the vinyl, but um, it can be reused. It's got little holes, but and sometimes we just, we get it for free, so we reuse it. I mean, we give it away. Sure. You had a question? Mm -hmm. okay. so it's in relation to that, I'm uh, Mello, I'm with Hammer and Cyclery, and we actually were able to do vinyl flooring like Lauren did this year, and it made such a huge difference in being able to just, like you said, roll that right up, bring that with us, we can shake that out when we get home, and then we could move underneath that. And it was, it w it was definitely heavy. We w ended up using used billboard vinyls, um, but it saved our asses last year. Okay. Do you have a question? Uh, just a comment on uh, moving. Uh, sorry, I'm Cabin Boy with Shipwreck Tea Lounge. We found that the past three years, having daily move shifts have really cut down on moving at the very end. So that we just found it like it's been phenomenal for the past three years. So, just yeah, awesome. All right, question in the front. Oh yeah. So I have a question about. So I know this is about teardown, but and um, the real challenge for us and some other camps I've been in has been um, the unload. So I know a lot of camps now have containers, and that's fantastic. But if you don't have a container, and I, I assume that you guys have been through this to some degree, how did you get people? Because then after teardown, people leave. So how do you get people at the actual unload to put it in lockers or wherever? That's Great the question. Who wants to? We'll, we'll all answer this one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we consider unload as sort of part of teardown. Um, people are arriving into the city at different times. Um, but it's pretty much if you're in town, it's all hands on deck until the truck is empty and clean and turned back into wherever we rented it from. Um, obviously, we have some people that stay through like Temple Burn or stay a little bit longer. It hasn't been an issue issue, but the expectation is if you're in town, you are there. And if you're not, it'll get called out. Um, so one of our expectations is uh, around now, we send out a crew email and give everybody dates for all of those times and say, block your schedules off now. You're required to be there. Uh, it can affect your good standing with our camp, and it can make us reassess whether or not you, you bring enough awesome compared to the effort. So our effort to awesome ratio can change for <laughs> uh, everybody who doesn't show up. Um, we also schedule it like the day after we get back, so people are not quite yet ready to say goodbye to each other you know there's there's a couple people that have to go straight back home you know we have people that come from chicago from you know this area um from vegas from denver but a lot of those people fly into seattle just so they can do our caravan to and from burning man because it's fun we do radio chatter we like crack jokes we look out for each other on the road um we help each other pass cars uh so the whole thing is it's a team and uh, we also kind of schedule that into our like shift requirements because because of the structure that we have um and because of like the security needs of uh, basically a sex camp um we have to have people on shifts at all times because if somebody sneaks in and they're underage we're we don't want to be responsible for that, right? So we schedule shifts really stringently. And one of your quote unquote household shifts involves like demooping and things like that. And we consider a dirty truck, you know, demooping. We don't want to have to take it back there and have them look at us and be like, we're never renting to you again. <laughs> Burners. <laughs> So uh, we just require that everybody shows up um, and we say this, we're going to do it from this time to this time. It's going to be hard. It's going to suck. And then we have our crunch day right before we leave, um, well, a month before we leave and we clean everything and make, make sure everything's in working order. So it's kind of, you know, either end. I have a, yeah. one last little bit. Sorry. Um, 
ducks are also a family. And so when people come back, you'll see people that maybe have taken a year off that will come to truck unload to help. So there are a few extra hands to kind of make up for the hands that are still out on Playa. Question from the audience. Hello again. Um, I'm sure we've all experienced uh, one or more of our camp members getting far too inebriated after the man burns or just during teardown week in general. <laughs> Maybe once or twice. <laughs> um, we actually had uh, two two of our uh, comrades last year spend all of Monday in the hospital, um, which ended up because someone partied a little too hard that didn't know how to take care of themselves. Um, how do you do that without strangling people? <laughs> um, whether it's like long term, do you not come back the next year? Or if it's someone that you know you can usually trust, like what, what do you do in that case to make sure that they can make a mistake and not affect everybody and not have that ruin your teardown too. Great question, very relevant. All three of you can. Uh, <laughs> so our camp is uh, what we call a sober camp, but not a dry camp. Um, so you're allowed to have a drink or do a thing, as long as you don't do it at camp, um, because we don't want you to hurt our infrastructure we don't want you to fiddle with the electrics and then everything goes bad because you're inebriated in camp if you're in danger or if you're like really like not doing well and you need to come back you you're welcome it's your home obviously but um you know as long as it's the no drama policy right it's not affecting every other person in camp um in the situation that somebody does get super inebriated the day before and before strike and then they're useless the next day there's a very serious conversation that needs to happen and again it's we're not opposed to saying okay so tell your whole crew why you can't do this today accountability. right accountability absolutely um or hey you know something weird happened there and then we dig a little bit deeper it's again a personal approach to making sure that everybody's okay. You know, somebody might be having a bad day and you have to be a little bit forgiving and you have to have, give somebody grace. But if it's like a problematic thing for that person, we just don't invite them back. Uh, yeah, we had one of our, like one of our most responsible people this year just go and we had to spend about an hour checking in and trying to wake him up his alarm was going off the whole thing um but that was an exception for him right so we had a talk he felt horrible I bet if I told him I talked about it, he would <laughs> shake his head um and and it's more about like does this person give a shit right does this person is this normal behavior if they're missing every strike then you're gone but you, you made a mistake and I know that you're not going to make it again um, and those tough to, you know this tough conversations sometimes have to happen after the playa you know and, and we did with this particular person what you guys said <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question following up on the um, the staggered leaving there comes a point like on Sunday afternoon when it's like you think you're like 80% done and people are sort of standing around and people are like, well, I guess I can kind of start peeling off. Okay, so what is your policy? Does everyone stay until the very end or do you let some people peel off a little early? Or what? Uh, No one's allowed to leave until the lead that's leading strike says you're good to go. So, yeah, that one voice that I was talking about earlier, that's the voice that you listen to. Um, no one's allowed to peel off until the okay is given. We have a lot of people that are there for build, so we give a little bit of grace to the people who have been there for you know a week and a half. Um, but if you haven't been there, you need to stay until. And we have a checkout system, so like if you don't check out, you don't get your spot checked for MOOP, and you weren't there at the end of strike, we're gonna we're gonna let you know about it. Um, everybody stays until the last thing is done. It's it, even if you're just offering like moral support or you know fluffing um everybody stays and uh typically with with our strike we strike 
partially on Sunday. I'll go to the Temple Burn together and then uh, finish our strike Monday and then continue into Tuesday morning. So we actually stay pretty late. Um, and most of our camp members really like that because there's not as terrible of an exodus. Yay! Um, they're like, well, I'd rather wait here and you know break things down than do anything else. So that's kind of an incentive for them. You've had your hand up for so long. I, I see you. I see you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so two things. One is, um, do you have a truck packing and labeling regime of any sort? Because... You know, uh, we had like a kitchen truck and then maybe a shade structure truck or the things that go into a storage unit in Gerlach. Is there a system you have? And then not- uh, Order of operations. <laughs> you guys mentioned this earlier about, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like the bins. Yeah. No, it's yeah. just like an organization oh, system. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Color, color bins. Yeah, like stickers or order, colors order or- Order of the pack. Kitchen goes in last, so it comes out early next year. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, do you guys take a skill? Do you guys take a skill inventory of your campmates? Do you have? Do you take a skill inventory of campmates? <laughs> so, to your first question, um, kind of. So we have <laughs> labeled bins. Like they're labeled with different colors of duct tape, and um, we have a specific way that we pack. But we basically just Tetris everything into trucks, and then kind of or- organize as we go. We're like, oh, and those all go over there, and then those go over there. Um, to your second question, uh, like a skill inventory, uh, people volunteer, so we kind of get to know people during our interview process, and then um, we're like, well, we need somebody who can run electrics. And nobody wants to mess that up. Is anybody good at that um, or willing to be trained at that? And we assign that to people. Um, In our camp, we have a very specific set of skills that are required to do what we do. So, yeah, we kind of generally have to do that in in, anyway. So Um, for the truck stuff, we have stops like in the Bay Area, in L.A., in San Diego, and most of our camp infrastructure is in San Diego outside of the containers that we keep with BRC. Um, And, yeah, we have to be really conscientious of it, like bikes, you know, making sure everything goes on okay. Because we've got generators to unload, stuff to drop off in Reno. So we usually have a truck lead who knows exactly where the stops are. You know, the people in L.A., if they're not done soon enough, then they're holding up the entire truck. So we try to be really clear about that. You've got to get your shit done in time. Um, But really, that's on someone else. (laughs) we want to make sure it's really important that that one person is in charge of what gets loaded and unloaded Um, and then skills Um, as we've been doing the new leadership questionnaire that's something that comes up and as campmates every year sign up we do have a list of teams that's possible to be on so um, we ask every member what team they want to be on Um, sometimes we assign people based on their skills um okay uh we have a truck a container that stays in gerlach we also have a truck that comes back to the city um so any projects that we know need work will go on the truck coming home everything we know staying in gerlach will stay in gerlach and last thing that goes in is always shade because it's the first thing that comes out when placement arrives um as for skills historically we have project teams and people just kind of sign up for a project hopefully within your skill but obviously we encourage people to sign up for things to grow skills Um, Just this year, in our questionnaire kickoff, we're asking specifically, is there a thing that you're good at? So we can get a little bit dialed in on what some of our new ducks are good at and maybe what some secret skills that other ducks have that we don't know about. Uh, hey, I just would, I, I'm Ben Jenner from Bumblepuss. Uh, I would like to pull the room and see who has, whose last person leaves on Saturday. Uh, nobody? What? Whose last, last person, whose last person leaves BRC on Saturday? No. Yeah, night of the burn. I'm just wondering if anybody, okay, then Sunday. Whose last person leaves on Sunday? Okay. Or, my, my, sorry, but. Is your camp empty by Sunday? Nobody? Okay. And Monday? Yeah, we do Sunday night. Okay. Some people have Sunday night. Okay. Monday. Who's, who's Monday? 
Okay, and who still has people there on Tuesday? Okay. And Thursday. Thursday. You you got Thursday. So what about Wednesday? Like, who's generally have people there on Wednesday? Okay. And and later than Wednesday? Okay. Last year we got a Thursday Okay. Was that intentional or? Yeah, uh, and so that's a lot of infrastructure. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Surprising poll results. A lot of people leaving after Tuesday. All right. Uh, my name is Topanga. I'm from BlackRock French Quarter, and I was wondering if you could help illuminate how to use traffic to your advantage to get people to stay. What the ideal timelines are um, for strike. <laughs> Um, so, uh, <laughs> are you you're talking about Exodus? Um, I, essentially, everybody, almost everybody that we have with us has experienced a god awful long Exodus before, and that's incentive enough for them to stay a little bit later. We also explain to the noobs uh, that. We're like, well, uh, if you stay a little bit longer, you get to kind of see the city get torn down again. It's kind of a beautiful thing to see, especially since we get there so early and watch it get built. It's kind of like a a finish to the week. And no, I feel like people tend not to get as sad after leaving when they see it all kind of collapse a little bit. It it, it makes me sad at the moment, and then it, it feels finished. But um, I think letting them know okay well you could be spending 12 hours in a hot dusty car in line hoping not to run out of gas hopefully you had enough tuesday tuesday yeah i i mean we we say tuesday and we we leave tuesday morning because we have a long drive to bend so Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, I feel like it's. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, just to answer that question, uh, Duck Pond tears down really early, so it's not super helpful. Like, we, our camp is down by the day the man burns, and so a lot of our camp will leave either like right after the man burns or right after strike. Um, I want to say that we uh, encourage a lot of people to take the Burner Express, and that will actually cut down on their exodus. I mean, like it's it's such a sweet little deal. Like you don't, you don't have an exodus, you can just take the bus. So you should stay until Monday. Take the bus on Monday, and that way they're trapped. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I guess another way to trap people. Uh, my question is, uh, do you guys oh, do you guys have any um, like communal sleeping shelter arrangements for folks that are tearing down um, who need to get their personal stuff down or loaded in trucks um, and for that last night especially if you're staying till Monday or Tuesday uh, no you bring your own <laughs> uh, you have your own tent we leave oh um, okay maybe it's like a half nope we do leave uh, like chunks of our uh, shade up so we'll tear down as much shade as there are people there so there's usually a good like third of our camp, fourth of our camp that will stay for Manburn and Templeburn. Um, so it's their jobs as they are leaving to take down the last of the shade, but we will leave them some protection until they're done. Yeah, we don't. Um, we we let people sleep in the frontage until Sunday, and then generally someone's going to leave before they need something Sunday night. Um, but we double up if we need to. Um, we do tent sharing, so if, if friends want to share tents, things like that. Uh, we also ask that people make a bivouac kit. Um, a bivouac kit is basically like all the things that you will need in one box. Um, and then if you are, uh, so we have things that we call pods. So a truck pod is like you pay into and you get to put all of your gear onto a truck, including your bike. Um, but... Uh, if you're part of truck pod, you can put all your other stuff in there, and then on that morning, all you have to do is load your last bin and great. Um, 
people who load all their own stuff into their own cars, their own vehicles. We try to minimize the amount of vehicles that we bring um, and carpool as much as possible. Um, some people will have slept in their cars, things like that. But uh, what we do during our build is we create what we call our condo. So all of our tents are kind of in the same area. So they kind of act as like a little wind block area. So, and then in the morning, we just all, when we're ready to go and everything but our tents are down, we help each other tear down our tents, fold them up and put them into the trucks and then go. I saw questions on this side. Um, I've been walking around Black Rock City towards the end of the week. Inevitably, I see camps starting to tear down. You know, one camp will be almost done, and the camp beside it hasn't even started yet. And even in this discussion, I've heard lots of different people talk about different timelines. How do you uh, decide with your camps what your teardown timeline is going to be um, for your camp? It's already decided before you get there. There's no wiggle room with that. It's really Sunday morning, tear down. Yeah, it, we're the same. Um, we basically from now until maybe like June kind of decide how long the camp wants to be there. Um, we have an early, early team that goes one or two days early and starts driving stakes and things like that. Um, but the way we decide is like, okay, how much time generally can all of these people get off of work and make it so everybody can stay through the entire gig? Um, and in general, um, we, at, we basically polled our group last year and we were like, how willing are people to stay until Tuesday? And 95% of people were like, heck yeah. But that became a requirement at that point because everybody was kind of like bought into it. And a, a couple people that were like, eh, kind of just fell into line, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so yeah, we just kind of say, this is when we're going to start strike. This is how long it should take if everybody participates. And this is when we go home. And we all have hotel uh, reservations anyway. So people are like, well, we got to get out of here by then. Yeah. I saw questions over there. I saw, actually, I saw you first. We'll just. Oh, this way. Um, and this maybe not is not a question for the panel because it. It is recording. Okay. Um, <laughs> Because <laughs> 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 um, it sounds like you guys all require everyone to stay till the end, but um, I'm part of Bow Chicka Wow Wow, and we have 130 campers, and maybe that's too many, and we're certainly evaluating that. Um, and I've heard loud and clear about the required teardown, and we require people to tear down, and it's still hard to manage 130 people. And we have a lot of people that come early and leave early for whatever reasons, come late, leave late. Um, so my question, I guess, is for maybe some of the larger camps that, we, that you have staggered leaving, how do you manage that? And how do you, not, how do you leave some things up for the people that want to stay late, but break down enough where the last 10 people aren't breaking down the whole camp, you know? So one of the things that uh, I'm with Vagabonds and Tagalongs, and we, we get DGS tickets that don't cover the entirety of our 50-person camp. If you, well, we're working on it for this year, and I'll let you know if it works, but you're not eligible for a DGS ticket from the camp unless you're there through teardown. Mm -hmm. um, You can, you can create a separate project for people. And then as for, like, what's left, you all as a camp, you just decide. Like, this is the day we, we finish the teardown. If, cho if somebody chooses to stay after that, and some of us do, we've, we've torn the shade down. You know, that's that. The major shade's down. And loaded in the truck. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a village of 255 people, so the, our car gets torn down pretty early. Um, any communal structures that are that are publicly facing, so the dance floor, that kind of stuff, or if you have a, the domes, that kind of stuff. Um, we actually have a, a build kitchen and then a regular kitchen. So the build kitchen is just a camper stove and like a, a smallish fridge, and that's way easier for like two people to pack away than 
the commercial kitchen, you know, the 120 person kitchen, which is really heavy and requires like, a, like matting and stuff like that. So, um, so you kind of almost throttle down your your camp needs. And, and similarly, when whoever's doing layout for your camp um, should be touching base with who's doing build and who's doing teardown, so that because like, we're huge, so like, we have to do it staggered too. Like we can't ask 255 people to stay. Um, but then you can have the, them cluster so that the build folks are all in one spot and then the teardown folks are like in an, another spot. So then the shade structures are more logical. So, so we're, uh, we're the Orgy Dome and we're about 150 people. And we, uh, we have a MOOP deposit that's usually about $150. And if you stick around till, till the bitter end, everybody that sticks around for that then splits all the money that's left. Right, right. So that that so to to no 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 absolutely. It's a it's a very reasonable concern uh, to to qualify that beyond just that that is a strategy. Uh, everybody that ha has the ability to, which I realize, like the I I've left early for to go to a wedding before to go to my brother's wedding. Every everybody that has the ability to stick around for as long as they can stick around does. The idea is not like oh I can just throw my hundred and fifty dollars and bail out of here on what's going on. No no nobody does that, and if they did, they wouldn't be invited back to camp. Um, but the idea is if you do have the ability and the energy in yourself to be able to stay towards that very end, especially in terms of mooping, like we have a very large footprint and there's a lot to make sure is taken care of there. Uh, we, we want to make sure that if you're taking that extra time off of work that we can cover, cover that in some way. I was just going to say that it, it, there's always things for people to do to help with strike, even if they're leaving earlier or later. So those people that are leaving earlier, you can think, what are the things that could happen now and give, give them a certain time requirement that they need to put in no matter when they leave. I think one thing that's really key about people leaving early is um, no, one leaves er no one has permission to leave early unless they've done checked in beforehand. Like before you get to the playa, we need to know what your, what your plan is so that we can, that we can adjust. Before. We had like something happened. We had someone who had to leave because their boyfriend's chemo was going really poorly, right? Stuff happens. So like we're gonna give you all the trash that we have that you can take with us. Or you know, I mean there's stuff that can be done and if there is that situation, you're gonna still be required to do something. So just a suggestion, I know every camp is different. We're disorient, we're 200 people. We have people out on Playa from the Monday before build week until Wednesday after the burn. And we like to think of things in a cell model. So if you want to come out and build and participate and be a part of our alpha cell, you're welcome to do that. And we want you to leave when it feels healthy for you to leave. And we also build out a huge disengaged crew. So we try not to overlap. So we intentionally divide those responsibilities. And I think it helps us build big art and have people doing what they love to do. But that also requires a lot of trust in people leaving when they say that they're going to leave and giving us accurate information. So it's a delicate balance, and I see it from both both sides. Question over here. Uh, we are Camp Lip Balm. We have about 100 people in our camp. Um, and basically what we do is uh, we have sign-ups for build. We have sign-ups for strike. And if you don't sign up for either one, then you get worked your ass off during the midweek. Uh, and then if you are part of the strike or build team, you also get a strike or build t-shirt that says, uh, you know, you sweat with us, you burn with us. So that's, that's the way we do it. Great uh, comment. Do you, do you have any kind of special swag uh, for anyone who goes above and beyond or? Um, so anybody who has literally been there from the time they get there or the time we start build to the last person, we want to reward them with their own special patch where they can like parade that um, and show it off to everybody else and also pins. Just one tip. Um, if you have trash and you have trucks, make sure the trash does not stay in the trucks for a week or two weeks. <laughs> I've seen camps do it before. 
Um, we actually we actually have a trash trailer that just goes. Uh, don't learn it the hard way, but I figure that might be useful for teardown folks. If you're On that note, how do people deal with trash? Because it's really a big problem. And <laughs> Too soon. So, I mean, we've tried no trash bins. We've tried, we have the sorting, and nobody ever seems to figure out their sorting. So we have, like, a trash problem. Can I share? Hi, Brooks again, Thor, Hotel California. We're really good at this. So what we do is uh, we utilize the resources on Playa to recycle and compost. That reduces what we have to deal with. Yeah, totally cool to do that. And and we have a tribe system of people. So uh, they're in charge of one full day of kitchen. They do that sorting. So that's handled. Then every individual is responsible for two garbage bags. Those are coming back with you. So leave room for them in your car or on your car. What's that? Yeah. They can take trash. That's exactly right. I try to take, so as strike lead, I don't want to take any, any garbage left with me, but I, I, I generally do sometimes. Um, and I put them in the containers and quickly remove them afterwards. Yeah. Um, we've had trash dumped on us three times before in my nine years. So new requirement is every person's expected to bring home however many trash bags plus room for two more. I mean, I've literally woken up to six trash bags and three bikes. And you're responsible for those. So you make sure le people leave extra space for other people's trash. So we've eliminated, we've eliminated uh, camp trash. There is no camp trash, um, right? Right? Yes, we're that good. Um, we're, everyone's responsible for their own trash. We have people who have volunteered to create meals for people in camp. They're responsible for their own trash. So really, because it, it got to be pretty bad, and one year someone left early and forgot to get the trash, it was a disaster. So no camp trash. Everyone's responsible for their own trash. We have time for one more question over here. This is actually just a comment on trash. Um, I was sorting through some of the trash that had come back this year, and you know, some odd bags always get dumped on you. And I opened up one of the bags. Somebody had left their cup with their license uh, imprinted on it, so they were busted. Oh yeah! All right. All right. Final question. Um, this will, I'm sure, vary by camp. One of the hardest parts for our strike, the like stuff that's always lingering, is food leftovers, snack leftovers. Booze leftovers. We have boxes for DPW donation. Some years we have like great master chef people who like cook up leftover stuff. Is there any like really great ideas people have for that like last folding table that's just like <laughs> weird stuff? So you've been to my camp, I guess. <laughs> so um, everybody kind of starts running slightly low on food towards the end of the week so we get that one table that um, we require everybody to bring all their own food except for breakfast that we provide every day so all those leftover things that people are like oh i don't want this anymore they put out on the table and people snack on during strike the entire time if it's not gone by the end of the strike if you put it there you take it back you pack it out with your own stuff um but it's kind of like a communal, like, hey, help me get rid of my food, and I don't want it anymore. If it stays there, it goes in, the, in our communal trash, which we only have one bin for that. And um, we're pretty big grudging about it. We're like, ah, whoever's is this is, you're in trouble. <laughs> I know that the ranger stations, mm -hmm. their bars, are always they're open at way after, right? They're mm -hmm. open for the week after. So that's what we do. We take like yep. the Tokyo Ranger Station, so we took our booze. Mm -hmm. Non-perishable something too. Yeah, yeah, food, mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. They're totally happy to get it. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, Pink Heart, we have a serious meats and cheese addiction towards the end of the week. And like it's used to be like Saturday night, but now it's like Thursday meats and cheeses. So um, we it's a table and we literally put it out in our frontage for anyone to take with the food they want covered, of course. And then our, our kitchen lead will make sure that the rest gets taken care of, cooked up, whatever. What about non-food items that are left over? We'll discuss <laughs> Um, it's a thing that we also are like struggling with. It's kind of as people are peeling off, kind of a begging of, can you just please sh shove five more items into your car? And we talk about it as a camp every year, and every year it's about the same. But it's not too bad. Like as people are leaving, we're constantly donating. And but yeah, that table is real, and it's just kind of like, all right, I've got an extra box of Oreos that I didn't bring. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple times, probably Saturday during dinner, Sunday during dinner, we'll have auctions. Oh, <laughs> auctioning off the stuff that's left. And, um, yeah. it, it, it inspires people to like, go through things. If their stuff was worthy auctions and during the auction, people will take like, the, the gross, weirdest stuff. Take that broken out wire, like, great. <laughs> Um, well, unfortunately, we're actually just about short on time, so I would like to thank these awesome panelists. Yeah. Um, uh, Hundred percent from Duck Pond, Endless Fun from Pink Heart, and Power Slouch from Suspended Animation. Next year, all of us here in this room will also lead this this panel because thanks to all the wonderful questions and comments from the group and um we have a break now so if you want to continue the conversations i think over coffee or alcohol let's do it thank you so much